Good morning. Um, my name's Alex Danoon. Uh, I have the pleasure of presenting today uh, a talk in relation to the future regulation of medical devices in the UK with my teammate Chiska Baras. Uh, we're both lawyers at Bristow's in the life sciences regulatory team. So thank you all for your time today. Um, today we will be running through a quick introduction to the consultation that the UK is undertaking. We'll go through seven key takeaways, so you can all leave at that point if you feel like it, and then we'll explain the areas where there has been a proposed harmonisation with the international standards and the European medical device regulation framework. Then we'll talk about points of divergence, and then we'll round up with opportunities, omissions and oddities. Um, before I do, I should mention who Bristow's are. We are a law firm in London. We uh, really focus on two key areas. One is tech and one is life sciences. And that means that lawyers like myself and Chiska get to do life sciences regulatory all day, every day. And the medical devices field is a great place where tech and life sciences converge. And we love advising in this area. So I'll hand over to Chiska, who will run us through a couple of introductory slides, and then I'll jump back in. Over to you, Chiska. Thanks, Alex, and good morning, everyone. So um, as many of you will know, uh, currently medical devices in the UK are regulated by the medical devices regulations. And this piece of legislation implemented the three European Union directives on uh, this topic. So the medical device directive, the active implantable medical device directive and the in vitro diagnostic medical device directive. The European regulation on medical devices that recently started to apply in May of this year has not been retained by the UK. So it is therefore not retained EU law after the 1st of January of this year when the transition period further to Brexit ended. So the medical devices regulation 2017 slash 745, as I said, um, applicable ever since May of this year, and the in vitro diagnostics regulation that will start to apply as from May of next year are not law in the UK. Therefore, the UK MDR applies, and in the region of Northern Ireland, the EU MDR does apply because of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Because of the need to update the UK MDR to the international standards, including the new system in the EU, the MHRA is seeking views on various updates to the UK MDR. And we feel reading at the consultation that the UK is really looking for comments and that it is very open to hearing what stakeholders have to say about the new system. You will see, and we will go through the slides in a minute, that most proposals are in line with the European system and international standards, but there are some interesting proposals that, um, if implemented, will diverge from the EU approach. And we are planning on spending a little bit more time on the latter because we feel it's more interesting that going through the points that are basically a harmonization from the EU system. So if we could go to the next slide, please. We have put together what we feel are the key seven points uh, or takeaways from the consultation. And um, 
Alex and I were discussing, if we only had to take two, uh, that would be innovative routes of market and safety. So they're both in, in this slide here, but maybe, as I said, we should start by saying or reiterating that the NHRA proposes a uh, ample degree of convergence between the EU new EU system and what the future system will look like in the UK. So most changes that are being proposed have been lifted from the EU MDR and the EU IBDR including those issues that were more problematic or more debatable at the start when the pieces of legislation were being debated at the EU Parliament. The MHRA is making a very big emphasis on safety. So you will see that lots of the changes that are being proposed are um, all to do with enhancing the safety of these products. Thirdly, um, of course, there will be some traditional transitional provisions, but they will not be as uncompromising uh, at, as those that we find in the EU MDR. And also uh, in view of the fact that they will be a high level or, of harmonization. Fourthly, as far as the conformity assessments are concerned, the MHRA intends to increase the level of scrutiny involved in these. And we will spend uh, some minutes uh, on this um, as we go along. Uh, in fifth place, um, as far as implantable devices are concerned, the MHRA proposes to have a higher level of scrutiny for these two and introduce some restrictions with regards to the path to market those products. One of the key issues uh, that we see in the consultation, as mentioned before, is the introduction of some innovative routes to market. We will um, have a look at the medical device single audit program, the domestic assurance route and the pathway for innovative medtech. And finally, um, as we've said, there are some situations when the MHRA is proposing some divergence with the European system and in this regard you will see that there are new rules as far as the environment is concerned, system in sustainability and public health impacts. Um, those of you familiar with the pharmaceutical medicines um, system will be familiar with these already and they are going to be introduced for medical devices in the UK going forward if adopted in the legislation. Finally, there will be a um, product liability insurance that will become mandatory in the UK, but we'll see that afterwards. Very much, Chiska. So I'm now going to walk through the areas of harmonisation <clears throat> um, it's fairly dry, but nonetheless, it is important to get a handle on these. So we'll be talking about the scope of the proposed UK MDR, the classification of medical devices, uh, the enhanced regime for economic operators, everyone's favourite, the registration and UDI process, the new approved bodies and their uh, regulation, post-market surveillance and vigilance, clinical investigations and performance studies, IVDs, and then software as a medical device, which comes up a lot for a lot of uh, attention. So on this slide, we're going to talk about the scope of the UK MDR, which is largely harmonised with the EU MDR and the EU IVDR. The same definitions of medical device and IVD medical device are adopted. Uh, one area that we think is worthy of particular note is the expansion of diagnosis to cover prognosis and predictions, a much broader sphere and we see a lot of attention in that area, particularly in relation to things like polygenic risk scores and genomic uh, work, and also some AI projects we're working on. In addition, the objective test for the intended purpose is based on the information in the instru uh, manufacturer's instructions for use. We also pick up uh, certain products without a medical purpose that come within scope of the regulatory framework, such as tattoo removal devices. 
Um, the classification of medical devices, we mirror the classification rules in the EU MDR. So by way of example, virtually all software is a medical device and we use the acronym SAMD. Virtually all is going to be classified class 2A or above. That was a big issue with the EU MDR when it first came along. Uh, and then the prohibition on misleading claims about medical devices, including in advertising. Uh, again, this wasn't as controversial with the EU MDR because there was already a right of action in the EU MDR, sorry, in the EU. Um, so misleading advertising, we think that might turn out to be an area where companies might have a new avenue for challenge in the UK as UK companies do not currently have a right to object to misleading advertising. The next areas of harmonization include harmonization of the concepts of the, the economic operator concepts. So the UK intends to adopt similar concepts to importers and distributors to mirror the new obligations in Europe. Uh, the UK responsible person obligations largely mirror the EU authorized representative obligations and liabilities. Uh, and we also adopt a similar approach to essential requirements um, and it also explicitly brings in-house manufactured devices within the scope of the regulation for the first time. We also have the concept of distance selling uh, to close a perceived loophole. We'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a minute. There are enhanced QMS requirements. We also have this new concept of a mandatory qualified person to assist with regulatory obligation. It appears to mirror the PRRC and is not something more akin to a QP for medicinal products. And then we adopt a similar regime to the EU Udemed and the EU UDI regime. The next area of harmonization is in relation to approved bodies subject to some more stringent uh, requirements. Uh, this is effectively in line with the EU MDR for notified bodies. There are a couple of points of divergence, a slightly more flexible approach whereby uh, the UK might, the, the MHRA might require slightly less frequent reassessments. Instead of annual, it might be um, up to uh, every five years. Um, and hybrid audits may also be allowed, including partially remote audits, really building on the experience with COVID. Uh, PMS and vigilance, it's really harmonized. Clinical investigations and performance evaluations are really on board with the EU MDR. However, it's quite clear there's a message coming from the MHRA that they really are uncomfortable with the possibility of equivalence product creep. Um, so there's there's quite a clear attempt to restrict reliance on equivalence, uh, particularly by emitting reliance, sorry, by limiting a lot reliance to reliance to a whole device. So the idea that arises a lot in uh, the US with the 510K regime, whereby you mosaic together your product from various pre-approved products. Uh, in order to get an approval uh, it, it is very unlikely to work in uh, the UK on a go forward. Um, and there are more requirements in relation to performance evaluations of IVDs in line with the IVDR. We're nearly done on the areas of harmonization. So the intent with IVDs is to have an increased scrutiny. So at the moment, the estimate is somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of IVDs require the involvement of a notified body or an approved body. Um, but the, uh, the the intent is to flip that around. So it'll be more like 85 percent of products will require the involvement of an external body. And this is intended to reflect international systems of regulation. There's a lot of alignment on classification of genetic tests, genetic information, patient notification and this uh, the introduction of the distance selling requirements which would close the loophole which was perceived where the blood sample was sent for example to america deployed on a test there and then the results sent back in that instance the equipment used in america must now comply with the ivdr or at least that's the intention and then there's the possibility of points of divergence for companion diagnostics because the regulatory framework is supposed to be proportionate to the risk of the companion diagnostic. 
um, and on software and medical devices. Whilst there's substantial harmonisation, there are some interesting points of di divergence and some initiatives. So very simplistically, this is a quick run through. In essence, the, the EU authorised representative will be equivalent to the UK responsible person. The PRRC uh, will be uh, replaced by a qualified person and the notified body is replaced by the concept of an approved body, but otherwise the concepts are very similar. So now we'll race through some areas of divergence. So the first is in relation to software as a medical device. There's a proposal to introduce a novel airlock classification rule, which is intended to enable temporary early market access for software medical devices with an unclear risk profile, albeit subject to enhanced monitoring and restrictions as if the product was a high risk device. So this could be a bit like a sandbox regime whereby while the software medical device is fully evaluated, there will be some mechanism to be able to get the product to market for uh, a temporary period. Now, it's unclear who would make the determination as to whether or not this product should go forward. Is that going to be the MHRA, the manufacturer, someone else? However, it is a very interesting idea that we could have this uh, the idea of an approval, albeit on a temporary basis, for and subject to ongoing uh, monitoring. Uh, so th that could perform provide a significant opportunity. Then the MHRA proposes to clarify whether software available from an app store or from a website is placed on the market by the operator of the app store or the website. Now, we don't know whether this is to bring the platforms into the economic operator framework or to exclude them. However, this could be a genuine divergence if the UK takes the view that the platforms are economic operators, because at the moment, most of those platforms do enable software medical devices to go to market, and they take the view that this is an agnostic facilitation role rather than an economic operator role. Uh, my impression is that if the MHRA was to take the view that the platforms are economic operators rather than mere facilitators, this would radically reduce the number of software medical devices that would be made available via these well-known platforms. And then the uh, MHRA proposes that the software must include a hyperlink to enable reporting of adverse events under an equivalent of the medicinal product yellow card scheme, albeit a digital version. The transitional arrangements, I know you are all hoping to hear a lot more about these, uh, the transitional arrangements, the MHRA is adopting a very flexible, well, an accommodating approach, a more proportionate set of options. Um, much like the position in the EU MDR, the cost of relying on the transitional provisions will be there can be no significant change in design or intended purpose during the transitional period. Uh, the device registrations will be phased in according to device risk classification. And during the transitional period, the new PMS obligations will apply. Um, so there have been various difficulties with uh, Article 120 of the EU MDR. I don't pro propose to go through them in detail, but uh, in essence, the MHRA proposes to follow that route. Um, and then clinical investigations that have commenced before the 1st of July 2023 could continue under the old framework. However, there will be additional reporting requirements in relation to matters like adverse events on a go forward basis. Turning in more detail to the transitional arrangements, um, devices that were certified and lawfully placed on the market before 30 June 2023 can remain on the market. It's a slightly odd turn of phrase. I'm not sure if that means continue to be made available or continue to be placed on the market. My own personal view is it's likely to be interpreted as continue to be placed on the market until either the existing certificate expires or a specified date in the future. And you can see from the dates here, 
that for devices with a UK CA mark, the MHRA proposes a further transitional period through to 2025 or possibly 2026. And for devices with a CE mark, the date, the uh, the drop dead date will effectively be in the future 2027 or 2028, but subject to an additional light touch assessment of those devices. Again, it's unclear who would conduct this assessment, the manufacturer, its approved body, or the MHRA. And then there'll be a further period of six, possibly 12 months, during which devices could continue to be made available. But much like the transitional periods in the EU MDR, uh, product must be taken off the market in due course or must no longer be sold by distributors at some date, albeit in the future. It's worth noting that the majority of MDD certificates, so certificates under the directive, are likely to expire in May 2024. So the provisions here that enable uh, the holder of a CE mark to continue to place products on the market through to 2027 or 2028 are likely to only realistically be for products that have an MDR CE mark. And then finally, uh, the approved body designations that have been issued before 2023 could be rolled over. This is really just a slightly more pragmatic approach so that people don't, so that approved bodies don't need to recertify immediately after July 2023. Uh, that raises the point. The intention in relation to this consultation is that the, the date of effect will be July 2023. Apologise, we should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, the conformity assessment process, the volume of devices that will require a UK conformity assessment with an approved body will increase. Uh, this is for multiple reasons related to software, related to IVDs, etc. Um, and this will lead to a lot more work, but also a lot more scrutiny. So uh, implantable class 2Bs will need to be, the documentation will need to be reviewed on a full basis rather than the representative basis. Manufacturers will be prohibited from lodging parallel conformity assessment applications with multiple approved bodies and see which one of them approves their product. Um, on the other hand, there will be some accountability for approved bodies. They will be required to respond to a conformity assessment application within a specified time limit. It's about the only point where the, uh, the, the feet of the approved bodies are held to the fire. Um, and then there will be an approved structure for manufacturer's technical files rather than just uh, in the guidance. The retention period for technical documentation could be significantly extended. So something like 15 years for implantable devices, um, and then somewhere, sorry, going from five to 10 years for all other medical devices. There's even the possibility this would be materially longer. Not quite sure what the value of that divergence is, but nonetheless. And then the MHRA is using this as an opportunity to delete some rarely used conformity assessment routes like batch verification, product quality assurance and type examinations. That's really reflecting the fact that these are very rarely used anymore. The MHRA has concerns with the implantable medical device market, recognising the unique challenges they pose, including the fact that in many cases they are not actually explantable. The MHRA wants additional scrutiny and wants the patient voice to be heard. In this regard, they propose significant restrictions on access to high risk implantable devices, for example, only permitting supply to centres with specialist expertise, only permitting supply to users with specialist practice and specialist expertise, and requiring proactive follow-up with patients to whom they administered, so a mandatory re registry regime. They also propose to increase the level of information captured on implantable medical devices over and above the core information already collected uh, in relation to general medical devices. And they want to reduce, if not savage, uh, reliance on equivalence in the assessment of, at the very least, high risk medical devices. So the proposals are to significantly expand the scope of the category to capture temporarily implanted medical devices, 
more demanding pre-market requirements, such as more robust clinical investigations. We all know that MDR stands for more data required. Uh, call out there to Eric Vollebrecht for that one. Um, and also to introduce additional monitoring and follow up, uh, providing information to practitioners on the management and use of obsolete models. So a great deal more burden here and then requiring a great deal more information to be provided to patients. I think in recognition of past scandals. This will, I think, lead to significant, uh, significant amount of additional burden for manufacturers of implantables, materially more than under the EU MDR. Um, other product specific changes, uh, there is going to be a new concept of remanufacturing of single use medical devices. And in certain circumstances, in these circumstances, there are going to be more procedures and controls in place. It looks like there's going to be UKCA marking for remanufactured devices. Uh, it's quite a complicated space, but I think we'll skip past that if it's OK. Um, and then there are some other product specific changes. So there is some harmonization on procedure packs and systems namely a new classification of kits, namely a set of components that are packaged together and intended to be used to perform a specific in vitro examination. There's a question as to whether systems, procedure packs and kits should allow external software to be considered as a component. Um, it's an interesting area. Uh, I'm not quite sure which way the MHRA is going to fall out on that one. And then there's harmonization on the regulation of components and replacement parts and then harmonization on custom made devices. I think that's our only reference to custom made devices. So for those of you in that field, I apologize. Now I'm going to hand over to Chiska, who's going to discuss alternative routes to market, which I think is a more interesting uh, area of divergence. Thank you, Alex. Indeed, the MHRA is proposing the introduction of three alternative routes to market, which could have a number of benefits. It, for example, as far as the enhancement of the supply of devices into the UK is concerned, and also to make the system more globally harmonized. So the first of them is a um, based on the program that is called the Medical Device Single Audit, the MDSAP. Some of you will be familiar with this program already. It was developed by the FDA in the US, the TGA in Australia, and Visa, Health Canada, and the Japanese authorities. The European Union and the WHO uh, have observation status, and now the MHRA, ever since March of this year, uh, has an observer status of this program. What this program does basically is that it allows a single regulatory audit of a manufacturer's QMS that satisfy the requirements in multiple regulatory jurisdictions. The assessments of the MDSAP will be carried out by auditing organizations. And what the MHRA is wanting to do is to take these programs into account um, when it comes to their assessment. The MHRA expects that the UK approved bodies will also be auditing organizations under this program. And to the extent that some of the auditing organizations will not have an affiliation to a UK approved body, the manufacturer will have to appoint a UK approved body to review the outputs of the auditing organization of the international program and review technical documentation before the UK certification can be issued. This doesn't mean that the UK approved bodies cannot undertake their own unannounced audits of manufacturers, but it does provide for um, some harmonization at global level and uh, some parts do not need to be, would not need to be replicated anymore. 
A second route to market that the MHRA proposes is the domestic assurance. Under this regime, the MHRA would accept approvals from other international medical device regulators that are um, prestigious and accepted by the MHRA. And these approvals would be subject only to a domestic assurance process. In this case, the UK approved bodies would carry out an abridged assessment. This route would not be relevant for manufacturers that have EU notified bodies that also have designation as a UK approved body, as they would have the option of obtaining a CE mark plus UK CA, that is a certification in both the, U the UK and the EU markets. And if you were to try and draw parallelisms between this MDSAP route and the domestic assurance route with the um, pharmaceutical uh, system. The first would be more similar to a decentralized procedure, whereas the domestic assurance would be more like a mutual recognized procedure. Now that's a good analogy. Thanks, Jessica. In the next slide, uh, we have tried to summarize the last of the three alternative routes that the MHRA is proposing, and that is the pathway for innovative medtech. So, if medical devices meet certain criteria, this pathway or route could be used. And in the consultation, there are three criteria um, for this route the size of the patient population to which the medical device uh, is related, so for rare conditions or for small patient groups. Secondly, the scale of the innovation, so devices that are considered as game changers for end users. And of course, we expect to be guidance on what that means. And thirdly, um, depending on the size of the manufacturer, um, wanting to help small and medium enterprises. Now, there is no clarity in the consultation whether these are uh, cumulative or not, but um, we hope they aren't because otherwise it would be limiting extraordinarily the manufacturers that could go down this route. And we do hope that this is clarified after the consultation. For this um, pathway is aiming for is to have a, basically a hub for innovation to support the manufacturer's research and gather data and activities in the UK going forward. The way in which this uh, route would work is that the MHRA would grant an approval, which would be for an interim period, so that the manufacturer could make the device available on the market before obtaining a UK CA marking, limited to specific circumstances. So again, um, certain patient groups or situations of an identified need. For this route to market, the MHRA would partner with NICE and other key healthcare partners so that the reimbursement can be integrated in the process. After the pre-market approval phase, the manufacturers using this pathway will have to switch over to the mainstream approved body route for UK CA markings and PMS. So this is just a system that enables the placing on the market earlier for these high quality products. Chiska, before we move off from that slide, how similar do you think this is to the conditional marketing authorization for medicinal products? That's a very good point. Thank you, Alex. Yes, indeed, this is the closest that um, we could think in the uh, medicinal products uh, framework. 
uh, for the conditional marketing authorizations, you are expected to eventually have all of the data uh, that you would expect under a normal marketing authorization. And the fact that um, you eventually, as a manufacturer, have to switch over to your normal um, UK CA marking um, makes it similar to that conditional marketing authorization that you have for certain medicinal products. And once again, unmet medical need rep. Exactly. All of that is the same terminology. Thanks, Jessica. Finally, we have much time on this, but just to make you aware of the fact that in the UK, there are going to be completely new rules when it comes to issues like the environment, uh, environmental system, sustainability and public health impacts um, because of the MHRA's aim to make the GB market more environmentally sustainable. So some of the changes that the consultation is um, pointing towards are um, the obligation of having an enver environmental and public health impact assessment as part of your conformity assessment. And you have this already with uh, medicines, so this would uh, introduce this obligation also for medical devices. They will, in the supply chain, manufacturers would have to introduce waste management responsibilities. Um, and then there would be um, an obligation for devices to be designed a, and manufactured in a way to reduce the risk that any substances or particles of these devices are. Um, not released or the release of these particles are reduced. Uh, finally, um, just to become more envi environmentally friendly, they will increase the situations where you will have electronic versions of labels and instructions for use uh, in order to reduce paper. So I think we're going to turn to uh, wrap up talking about opportunities, emissions and oddities. And I think what we'd like to think about while we're asking, what, while we're looking at this slide is the MHRA is quite clear that it does not want to be a dumping ground. It doesn't want to be a mere rubber stamping jurisdiction. And so the, the opportunities that they have identified and set out in the consultation is quite clearly to try and find an accelerated move to, uh, path to market in certain circumstances so that the UK is a proving ground, not a dumping ground. So I guess the question we're asking ourselves is to what extent do we think this is achieved on balance here? So I think we're talking about the innovative routes to market that Chiska just mentioned, which could well be a very significant opportunity. And it's worth emphasizing there that in relation to the innovative med tech, it will be the MHRA that conducts the approval and issues the interim approval rather than the manufacturer or notified body. Uh, on the other hand, the implantables being limited to specialist centers, is that an opportunity for the implantable market to grow uh, and really be focused on what it's good at, or is that going to end up a limitation? The new remanufacturing approach might make the, might mean that the UK has more opportunity for reusing single-use devices. And the hybrid audits and th that uh, Chiska went through in some detail, I think really do provide an opportunity for a very nimble approach by the MHRA. And the MHRA, I think, is trying to be more trusting of device manufacturers. So uh, trust but verify, however, do it in a logical manner that recognizes reality. The emissions and oddities, we're not quite sure why there is such a concern about uh, equivalence and trying to make uh, the reliance on equivalence so difficult. Um, and then similarly, it's a little odd that the 
a pro the proposal to create a GB infrastructure that will replicate largely Udemed and the UDI scheme, it's quite difficult to work out how a much smaller and arguably parochial GB database database will actually uh, be useful. Um, and it's slightly questionable, is it worth the effort to duplicate all the functionality and might another approach have been adopted? whereby, for example, the UK uh, might have been able to cooperate more closely with the European Commission in relation to Udemed. It strikes everyone in the uh, in all of the stakeholders I speak to that it would have been much better if we could have had a kind of mutual recognition there rather than this slightly weird hybrid where Northern Ireland will be covered by Udemed, but we'll have our own version for Great Britain. So on balance, Chiska, can I wrap up with one slightly mean question for you? I promise I'll answer it myself as well, but one slightly mean question. Do you think that on balance, the MHRA's proposal gets it about right in terms of the extent of harmonization and some innovation? Yes, I think so. I mean, there are still uh, quite a few open questions. And if you read the consultation, in some instances, the MHRA is not really expressing a view. On some instances, there is more of a, a expressed opinion on the MHRA on how it's going to, how will things look like uh, further down the line. But personally, I think that especially with the innovative routes to market, the MHRA is striking a good balance between harmonization plus introducing some uh, opportunities for developers of medical devices um, in the UK. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, much the same. I think significant deviation or an, an, a, a parallel regime that was materially different I think would probably have left uh, the UK in a weaker position. But I think this really is a very good proposal whereby there'll be a great deal of harmonization across the main bulk of the uh, regulatory framework, but with the opportunity for some accelerated access uh, points of contact. So I think it's, uh, it, it, it's a very welcome consultation. Um, I'm genuinely uh, impressed with it. I know that most of the clients I've spoken to have been positive and intriguingly, a lot of them do intend to make submissions. And that in turn, I think, shows that there's a lot of goodwill uh, around in relation to this particular topic. So I think, unless you have any questions for me, Jiska, uh, it falls to um, thank the audience for their time and uh, wish them all the best with the consultation. Thank you. All the best. Thanks Bye. a lot, everyone.